So thank you for inviting me here to present the last result of this research that we've done. And also what I would like to give you is a bit of a taste of what would be to work with the parasite in terms of fascination because these are very special cells. And also in terms of challenges because they are not easy organisms to work with. So I have to admit, this is a new project also in our department, and so it's not lipid related much, but as I said, I like challenges a lot, and that's what we undertook recently. So I guess your first question would be why to work with Giardia, because it's not a very popular parasite. Oops, sorry. So two reasons. One is also a pathogen. It's not a lethal pathogen but it's quite debilitating. As you see from the name, it's called also Giardia intestinalis, duodenalis, is an intestinal parasite that colonizes the small intestine of the host. High, I mean, high variety of mammalian uh, hosts are colonized by this parasite. And the symptoms, they start from diarrhea and then they can progress to malabsorption and growth impairment. This is, of course, happens when the disease is not treated. The second reason that can trigger their interest to study this parasite is its phylogenetic position. So these parasites branched very early in the eukaryotic <coughs> tree and is considered to have two billion years of independent evolution. And it's like looking through a window in the past, basically this is a living fossil. And this puts a lot of interest, but also a lot of question mark, what can be considered the core of a eukaryotic cells, if this parasite can give some answer for this question. So a few words about the disease. As you can see from the distribution of the disease, this is not an exotic parasite. It's also called a tra uh, causing the traveler diarrhea, but it's not the only place to get infected with this. And you can see actually one of the major, I mean, very frequent case of outbursts happens in Canada and in the States. Also in very pristine and beautiful, beautiful location of the natural park, there are basically infested with Giardia in the streams. But of course, the major problem arises in underdeveloped de developing countries, basically, because the treatment is not affected and available immediately, and that can cause problems, for, especially for the children, because they are more prone to get infected with this parasite. And the prevalence is quite high, 30 to 30, 20 to 30 percent in this area. Good news, the disease can be treated. So there's a spectrum of antiparasitic antibiotics that are available. But of course, to get to these villages is not the priority of the big companies. So the problem still remains. And that's why a big boost also in the research happened in 2004 when this disease was included in the initiative of the WHO for neglected disease, basically. But overall, this map tells you that the parasite is one of the most successful in its gender because it's so widely spread and it does not kill his host. And this is pivotal for his survival because if you remove your host, of course, you remove also the parasite. So it's a quite smart organism. How does infection occur? This is the source of all problems, basically. These are cysts that are environmentally resistant, so they are surrounded by the thick cyst wall, and the parasite can survive for months or years in also unfavorable condition. And where these cysts can be found are in water, and this is the major cause of infection, basically. If the water reservoir gets contaminated, then you have these big outbreaks of also in developing, developed countries. Also, contamination of vegetables is a very popular um, place where to acquire the infection. And pools. And pools and kids together and playground, these are the best place to nourish a bit. The, the giardia and where the infection takes place. So as I said, the infection occurs per orally, and then when the parasites reach the intestine, you have a conversion. So for the rest of my talk also, we talk about stage differentiation, and that means when the cyst becomes a trophozoite. This is the vegetative form that is flagellated, has eight flagella, and is highly mobile, and it can colonize the intestine. And then it can create the damage, basically. And finally, when 
the environment in the, in, in the intestine is not favorable anymore for the parasite, there's another stage conversion. And the trophozoites reverse to a cyst, basically. And the cyst gets secre excreted with the feces, and this contributes to the spread of the infection. And as you can see, the cycle of this parasite is very, very simple. There's only two stages compared with other more sophisticated parasites like plasmodium or toxoplasma. This is a very basic and simple life cycle. And this is the leitmotiv of all the aspect the study of Giardia. So the key word for this parasite is economy, economy and simplicity that you see both in the cell cycle and then I will describe also in the cellular processes and metabolic functions. This is to give you an idea of the power of the parasite. So one or two cysts are enough to get the infection going. And the time to go from the first injection, in acquisition of the cyst to the release of the other cyst is 72 hours. So it's also pretty fast. And the amount of cysts that are released is from 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 9. So you can really imagine the power of the infection and spreading of disease that can occur. And this is a very important part of the slide. All these processes can be mimicked or obtained also in vitro. And that's why the parasite is a very useful model for other parasites that also go through this cycle of cyst formation, so cyst forming parasite but these stages cannot be replicated in vitro. So this parasite is an important parasite to study, not only for Giardia's sake, but also for understanding the biology of other parasites. So a bit more detail on what happens in the intestine. If you remember here, this structure, uh, the structure of this form of the parasite is quite complex. And here there's a disc. So he has a symmetry, a dorsal ventral, Size. And here in the ventral part, there's a disc that is important for the adhesion of parasite to the intestine. So it's, very, it's a mechanical sucking process. And when the parasite gets attached to the intestine, of course, it cannot be released. So it's, it sticks to the, to the walls and it can create the damage. So what happens is that the tight junction of the enterocytes of the cells, so the epithelial cells, get destructed. And then, the, of course, the cells undergo apoptosis. And that induces an increased epithelial permeability and diarrhea, of course, and then the shortening of microvilli. And in this case, you have malabsorption and all the problems related to this phenomenon. And this we have one of the first question marks, because so far, no virulence factors are known of this parasite. So it's not clear how it can create all this damage. And there are several theories that there are products secreted by the parasite, for instance, proteases, that can mediate or help these effects. But the real mechanism, the cause, is not, has not been identified yet. And also important to mention that this colonization does not trigger a high immune response of the host cells, so the parasite clearance does not occur. And that is supposed to happen for two reasons. So first, the parasite is coated by surface protein, and this surface protein changes very frequently. And there's only one protein expressed per cell, and there's this cycle of shedding on this protein and new protein that are expressed again. So the immune system does simply not have the time to build up a strong immune response. And the other hypothesis that is, has been currently investigated is that the parasite is a voracious uptaker of arginine from the host cells because he needs arginine to build up the cyst, the wall of the cyst. And this arginine removal basically prevents the host cells to produce nitric oxide. And this is a strong immunomodulatory uh, molecules. So these two elements work together to guarantee that the parasite can stay long enough for his own survival inside the intestine of the host and to create this damage but not so dramatic that the host then the viability of the host is compromised. Next slide takes the title from the basically the a recent work published to describe the complete sequencing of the genome of the parasite in 2007. And 
again, this parasite was called en very enigmatic. So even though it's very basal and simple, can be also quite confusing. But from this work clearly came up that minimalism and economy, as I mentioned before, is a trademark of this parasite. Is the economy is found not only at the level of DNA, so the genome is highly compact. Basically, the majority codes to, uh, corresponds to coding region. There's no much junk DNA in this genome. But also at the level of organelles. So a lot of organelles that are typical of a eukaryotic cells are not found in this parasite. And this includes, for instance, the Golgi apparatus, mitochondria, and peroxisomes. There's also minimized cellular machinery. So secretion of protein, metabolic pathway are all highly reduced. So it's very effective and very, very effective basically in, in keeping the elements that are essential for his survival and get rid of the excess of metabolic and those organs. But the only thing that is against this concept of economy is the presence of two nuclei in these cells. They are both transcriptionally active. So the question mark at the end of this work was, it's true, the parasite has very simple characteristics, but are they actually primitive? So can Giarda be considered like the primitive eukaryote from which all the other eukaryotic cells developed? Or is it actually simple because he lost all these other organelles just because he didn't need them for his niche, because he's highly specialized parasite for highly specialized place where to, to survive? And this is still a very strong debate, I mean, to really try to understand and give a final answer to this question. These are just a couple of examples of this simplification of cellular processes. This is the comparison between Giardia and yeast, and the two organisms have a similar genome size. And so, for instance, for initiation, DNA replication, transcription, and polyadenylation, you see visually the amount of components that are found in Giardia is are much more reduced compared to the yeast homologue. And then, this is, of course, I expect you to know all this pathway. This is basically uh, the <coughs> glycogen metabolism and adenine. And you see in they were blue here, they are this purple. These are homologues with higher eukaryotes. This red, actually, they are enzyme homologues with archaea. And then this pink are the homologues with bacteria. <laughs> and the black one are the enzymes that have no homologue whatsoever with other organisms. So basically, the metabolic pathways are a patchwork, basically, of known enzymes, but from really different ring species. So it's like Giardia wasn't really sure what to be. So finally, some anatomy of the parasite. Again, it's quite simple. You see, this is the, the shape of the trophozoite, the, the flagella are omitted in this case. You see the two nuclei that I mentioned are always at the apical part of the cells. In brown, these are mitosomes. I mentioned there's no mitochondria in the parasite, but there are relics of mitochondria, and these are called mitosomes that are there's a central one located between the two nuclei and other small vesicles scattered throughout the cell body. PVs are peripheral, peripheral vesicles. They are on the surface of the parasite and also in this central area. And these are, can be considered a lysosome equivalent of the parasite. So it's where endocytic processes take place. Basically, they open to the outside, I mean, the environment and they can sample what's, what is present in the environment. And then from this organelle can happen the real endocytic process. And this area that is in the center of the ventral and this is also a area where highly dynamic for endocytic processes. ER, at least this is known from what is characteristic to have this perinucleal staining that you see around here. ESVs, these are very peculiar organelles. So they are called encystation specific vesicles. You can already imagine that they are specific for the encystation process when the trophozoite becomes a cyst. And if you remember, I said there's no Golgi in Giardia, but these are Golgi equivalent or organelles with Golgi like characteristic that appears only and exclusively during the process of en encystation. 
It's like the parasite makes what he needs exactly at the time when he needs it. And this is, given that it's going to be the topic of then my research, I will spend a little bit more time to describe how this occurs, this process of NC station that is called stage differentiation. So these are the system micrometer or less length surrounded by a matrix that is here you can see the DM and is composed by a very limited number of components. Basically there are three structural proteins and a matrix of polyglycons and this is enough to confirm the resistance of this parasite. And all these components, basically, they are synthesized at the time when NC station is triggered. They first, I mean, this is just a label with one of these three proteins, but they all behave in a similar way. They are synthesized in the ER, and then they are sorted, because the sorting then occurs only on the ER, given that there's no Golgi. And they are concentrated in these vesicles that contain exclusively the material that has to be secreted to form the cis wall. And then the material, as I said, is secreted. And once it's outside of the whole cells, then out of the cells, it gets, um, has a capability to form this matrix. And this is the time plan of this secretion. So synthesis translocation, of course, in the ER. Then we have protein of the COP2 and COP1 uh, secretion components that mediates basically the budding of these vesicles. RAB1 is also involved and then the, when these ESV are formed there's the maturation of these components also taking place inside of them before the secretion. So there's trimming processing occurring inside these vesicles. So you see clathrin and dynamine are also involved in a, when, to allow the accumulation then the secretion of this material. 24 hours is where the entire process ends, so it's pretty fast. And there's a peak of synthesis of this protein eight hours post-induction. So despite the fact that this stage conversion is critical for the parasite survival, because currently the survival in the, in the environment, not much is known about what actually drives this cyst formation and actually the induction of these genes. So, so far only basically five uh, events or processes are shown to be involved in this stage differentiation. And first is an enzyme that is involved in the synthesis, sphingolipid synthesis, conversion of ceramide to glucose ceramide. And I put it at the beginning now because it's the most important, but because this is my actually major topic of research. Then signal transduction based on kinase and phosphatase is also involved in the process. Arginine deaminase and dipeptidyl peptidase 4 are also being shown to be essential in this process. But when we talk about the transcription of the genes necessary for the stage conversion, really not much is known. There's only a couple of transcription factors factor that have been found to be important for this phenomenon. So our question was maybe other regulatory mechanisms that are based not on transcription factor but on epigenetic regulation can be involved in this process and there where we started our analysis. So of course when we talk about epigenetics we talk about modification of histones and especially of the core histone that constitute the nucleosome where the DNA is wrapping, is wrapped around. So all these four histones are conserved, are found in Giardia, so good news for us, but they are not really conserved. So technically speaking, none of the antibodies that are commercially available can be used to analyze the Giardia histones. In any case, I mean, they are there and we can hypothesize, I mean, the N-terminal tails are also present and these are important because it's where all these modification, epigenetic modification take place. And you can see, I mean, there are several acetylation, methylation, phosphorylation, and so on. And what we focused on was in acetylation, because all this modification can affect the gene expression. And acetylation specifically can change the conformation of the chromatin. So high level of acetylation that are induced by the action of uh, acetyltransferases, they 
induce a more relaxed form of the chromatin and then they promote the transcription. While the removal of these acetyl groups and so the exposure of the positive charge of the lysine then will create a more compact structure where the transcription is more unlikely to occur, both for steric, I mean, conformational issue, and then can also be involved in the recruitment of effector molecules to this chromatin. And this, con I mean, the conversion to hyperacetylated to hypo, uh, hypoacetylated form is mediated by this HDH, histone deacetylase. Importantly, this, the stage or the state of the acetylation of DNA has been also found to be very important in the progression of the cancer. And especially the hyperactivity of HDH has been found responsible in this pathological situation. That's what boosted the research to find inhibitor of this enzyme to be used as anti-drug, anti-cancer drugs. And this is just to show you what is known at the moment. There's four major class of the inhibitor. There are short chain fatty acids, hydroxamic acid, and this is the one that is depicted in this picture. Cyclic tetrapatase, these are important because they are the one that we used actually in our research. And then benzodiamides. And you see that basically the inhibitor, they fill up the catalytic pocket of the enzyme, blocking, of course, the recognition of the substrate. So what we did was pretty simple. First, we tested if GRD is actually capable to acetylate his system. And if this acetylation level changes during the stage differentiation of the parasite. So color coded, so the purple is actually the trophozoite and the green there are the insisting cells. And what was clear, both via facts, quantitative analysis, and IFA, that the level of acetylation decreases during insistation. And this is quite easy to understand, consider that the cyst is a quiescent form, so in theory, it doesn't need too many genes to be transcribed at that stage. And then we actually checked if Giardia contains the enzyme that are responsible for this acetylation, deacetylation, and we just focus on the four major acet enzymes that mediate acetylation, deacetylation. And first, you can see immediately that demethylases are actually not present in the parasite, not found, I have to say. So either they're not present or they're so divergent that cannot be recognized in his genome. And the other element that is quite interesting, that amongst the class of histone deacetylases, we have only one component of the canonical HDH. So seems, and this is very different compared with other parasites where at least five different forms of the enzyme is present. And again, this is corroborating the idea that Giardia is very simple also for the cellular machinery. And that was also pretty good news for us because there's only one enzyme to target with the inhibitor base. So this is the Giardia enzyme blasted against uh, human, mammalian, or other parasite. You have the toxoplasma enzyme here, and you see immediately high level of conservation of this protein, both at the level of amino acid and also the, the basically the secondary structures. And all, what is important to notice, all this triangle shows that the residues that are contained, the catalytic side, are highly conserved, are present basically in the parasite. So it's a good reason to believe that the, the enzyme can be active and also can be inhibited by the N inhibitor in this parasite. And what I highlight in this case is an extension that is found only in Giardia, but not in other in the enzyme. The biological significance of this insertion is not known, but for you to, as a much of a comparison, in other parasites, there's another extension that is typical of apicomplex and is only two residues, AT, and this confer the sensitivity to the inhibitor. So these two residues are essential or enough to confer the capability of this enzyme to be inhibited and also to kill the parasite. So more about the structure of this Jambia HDH. Here we did the modeling based on the human HDH8 whose structure was recently resolved. 
and you see immediately that the structure is really highly conserved and the position or orientation of the residues that are involved in the catalytic site are also conserved. When we express this recombinant protein, the parasite, we found that it's actually localized in the nuclei, so this is excellent because it's where actually should be to mediate the deacetylation reaction. And then we did a modeling using an inhibitor that is one of the recently developed and not yet commercially available, but has been shown very interesting and powerful properties against other parasites, you can completely block the replication and also kill plasmodium, basically. And the inhibitor perfectly and nicely fits in the catalytic pockets of the Giardia enzyme, and here is where it, mm -hmm. there's the interaction with the zinc atom. So, so far, so good. We have a tool, an inhibitor, and we have the enzyme that we can target. And that was our working hypothesis. So the stage differentiation of the parasite is accompanied by a reduction in acetylation of the histone. So what happens if we block this process by inhibiting the HDH of the parasite? Would the parasite be unable to differentiate? So would it just stay in this loop of just replication? Or it will do some other elements? So this is what we tested. Putting the inhibitor that I showed you before in the 3D modeling on the parasite, you see the acetylation of the histone increases. So the target is present and the inhibitor does what it's supposed to do. And you see also visually that the acetylation of the nuclei increases and this is the quantification by fax. Importantly, other proteins that are also acetylating, in this case tubulin, they do not increase their acetylation level in presence of the inhibitor, showing that this inhibitor is actually quite specific. It's not inhibiting whatsoever, I mean, the acetylasing. And also can tell you that the parasite HDH is not likely to accept tubulin as a substrate. And this is finally the phenotype. After all this control, we can see that we monitor the expression of the cis protein 1, that one that forms the cis wall, and this you can see in the control cells, you have a high prevalence of for cis formation. In presence of the inhibitor, though, the cysts are really barely detected. And this is just the cyst, and this is the total expression of the protein, so this is controlled. There's a peak compared with the untreated, I mean, this U is also the, the trophozoite, there's a big increase of synthesis of this protein. But when we put the inhibitor, the synthesis is highly hampered. This is a dose response showing that also at na low nanomole concentration, the inhibitor is effective in reducing this uh, synthesis of the protein. And this is what we did. We tested another bunch of HDH inhibitor, and actually they are all acting as an inhibitor of stage differentiation with power and the potency slightly different, but that is also another nice confirmation that this enzyme is really highly important in this process. These are another set of controls, so we wanted to see actually if other proteins are downregulated when we put this inhibitor, and we tested three different constitutively expressed proteins, SAR1, cytosolic protein, PDI2 is an ER marker protein, and clathrin that actually localized to this PV that I showed before. So none of these three proteins actually is downregulating presence of the inhibitor. So again, pointing out to a very specific effect of the inhibitor. Then we use SAR1 protein to actually analyze which are the elements important for the responsiveness to the inhibitor. What we did was to take this protein and to put the flanking region of the cis wall protein that is responsive to the inhibitor. And after transfection of this construct, both episomally or also integrated in the gene of the parasite, you see that SAR1 that has this flanking region is responsive to the inhibitor. So these few hundred nucleotide base pairs are actually sufficient to um, mediate the inhibitor effect on the trans gene transcription. So this was done on insisting cells, on the conversion from trophozoite to to cyst. Then we actually treated just the, the trophozoite, the vegetative stage with the, per, to, with the inhibitor to see if there's actually in this case a stage conversion because in other parasites has been shown that similar inhibitor, they block the switch 
in either way. So if you put during stage conversion, they block the stage conversion. If you put the inhibitor in the vegetative stage, they induce the stage conversion. So it seems that there's uh, the regulatory enzymes are specific for the stage where the parasite is found at the moment. But in this case, at least in the GR situation, the inhibitor can also induce hyperacetylation in this stage of the parasite, although it's not as prominent as in, in cysteine parasite. It's definitely not reducing the parasite replication. This is monitored both for trophocyte and also in cysteine cells, so it does not have toxic effects. But it's also not inducing cis wall protein expression, so it's not inducing the cyst conversion in this stage of the parasite. Then what we monitor, because of course epigenetic mechanisms are also supposed to actually act on the gene expression, we did a microarray in both situations, so inhibitor treated trophozoite and insisting cells treated with the inhibitor, and we compare the profile of this gene expression. And immediately you see that there's not many genes that actually are regulated by this inhibitor and they correspond to the two, one or two percent of the entire gene present in the parasite. And this is actually a value that is similar to what happened in other eukaryotic cells. So we don't have huge general transcription modulation that is also pointing out to the specificity of the effect. And visually, you can see there's a high overlap of the gene modulated in both stages of the parasite. So it seems that the response is very similar, despite the fact that the parasites are in two different stages. And the majority of the gene are actually up-regulated in both stages. And this was the ontology analysis of the genes that are regulated, and this is what I mentioned about the challenges in Giardia, this is one clear example. So the majority of the gene modulated are hypothetical proteins, so we don't know what they do. The second class of highly regulated genes are these high cysteine membrane protein of the parasite that are found on the member of the parasite, but whose function is also not known, so not much useful. Then the third group are these neck kinases. So I have to mention that despite being a very simple parasite, it has a huge expansion of the kinome. And basically, 70% of this kinome is composed by neck kinases. And 80% of these neck kinases, they are supposed to be inactive. So that turns out that a lot of this protein, we, don't we cannot do much with them, but it also points out that Actually, the effective kinome is very, very shrank in this parasite. And other proteins are metabolic, basically, enzyme. But what is important to note is that in the insisting parasite, all the non-structural proteins that are required to form the wall are downregulated, together with the transcription factor MIB2 homologs that is supposed to be one of the master regulators of this insistation. And this is quite strongly point supporting our I mean, phenotype that the inhibitor actually blocks the cis formation because all the genes important for the, the cis wall formation are downregulated. The next question we asked was if actually these genes that are responsive to the inhibitor treatment are localized in clusters. So it can have uh, the spatial location of the enzyme can have an effect based in this case. And this was done statistically to analyze the potential of the gene regulated that are basically located in um, nine contigs. And you see there's no basically cluster found, except you see three asterisks here. There are three areas where the hypothesis of non-cluster can be excluded. So statistically, do they could be clusters of gene, but biologically we don't know if this is significant or not. And then we are already at this summary at this point. So what we found is that the simple organism has acetylation of the histone, so has epigenetic regulation, and basically the level of this acetylation decreases when the parasite converts from the trophozoites differentiate to the environmentally resistant cyst. We can alter this process by inhibiting 
a single enzyme HTH and that blocks the conversion so the parasite is resilient, it is not responsive anymore to the trigger to encystation and remains in the vegeta vegetative form. Um, what else we showed that the inhibitor of FGH um, HDH are actually very effective in modulating the gene expression of the parasite and importantly they don't kill the parasite so what we see is not due to the fact that the parasite is under stress or toxic condition we are actually affecting a very specific system without uh, completely destroying the parasite biology at this stage and then what we showed that actually this inhibitor induces a, a specific downregulation of encystation specific genes. And this leads to the big question mark, how does it happen? Because if you remember from one of the first slides, basically the removal of, a, I mean, the high level of acetylation, they should induce high level of transcription. In this case, we observe the reverse. So all these genes that are expressed during cystation are actually downregulated, despite the fact that HDH is inhibited. And this is where the interesting part will be also in the future. And we have candidates that inhibitors of these genes are present and they can be regulated by the action of acetylation. So we have basically an upregulation of this inhibitor that they keep blocking the expression of these genes and so the entire process cannot occur. But this is important because they are even upstream the transcription factor has been found so far. So it's really one of the first steps in the process. But about this topic we don't know much yet and all these cheap analysis of the acetylation level of the promoter still has to be done to understand it. The question. And finally, the most important slide is to thank the people that collaborated to these projects, and so especially Laura Morf and Iveta Votova, they are two PhD students that contributed it. Adrian is actually the laboratory head. Then we have from the Université Joseph Fourier um, Ali Akimi that actually provided us with the inhibitor. Um, Functional Genomic Center has to be acknowledged because all the microarray analysis has been done by these two very talented people, Hans Rudy Bachmann and Hubert Reauer. And then the modeling of the protein has been done with the help of Amadeo Kaflisch from the Biochemistry Institute at the University of Zurich. And last but not least, these are the funds and financial support that we received to continue and carry on of our research. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>